Good evening again, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Applied Linguistics and TESOL seminar, outlining some of the courses we have in this area at uh, Macquarie University. And also, more importantly, uh, we'll be joined by some panelists tonight who will be able to tell you a lot about the kinds of career opportunities that are available in this uh, particular area. Peter Roger is my name. I'm the uh, Director of Applied Linguistics and TESOL at uh, Macquarie University. And um, I'm joined tonight as well by uh, Agnes Bodis, who is the convener of the Graduate Certificate of TESOL. And uh, she'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Just before we begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the um, traditional custodians of the land on which Macquarie University is located, uh, the Watamatagal clan of the Darug Nation whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. And uh, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land uh, that any of you are located on um, in different parts of uh, Sydney and indeed Australia. Just to let everybody know, this uh, session is being recorded um, and uh, if you've got a question for any of our presenters, use the Q&A function on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can um, uh, pop your question in there. All of the questions will be moderated and we'll either respond um, uh, by typing a response online or respond live um, uh, orally. Uh, and we can assign the question to the person on the team who's best able to answer it. Many people wonder, what is applied linguistics? Basically, applied linguistics refers to the application of language studies to understand and offer solutions to real life problems. Um, and so on the left of the screen there, you can see uh, a big piece of machinery. And that piece of machinery is actually used to dig uh, tunnels underneath um, different parts of Sydney. And one of the people in that picture is actually an applied linguist. And uh, she is in charge of uh, community liaison, managing the relationships between the companies and the government involved in the infrastructure project and the residents who are affected by the, uh, by the building. So you might think that's a very unusual job for a linguist, but you can find linguists anywhere. And uh, this is what makes it a particularly exciting uh, field. But a more traditional place where you'd find applied linguists is in a language classroom. And uh, probably many of you tonight are interested in uh, uh, English language teaching. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about the uh, Master of Applied Linguistics in TESOL degree that uh, Macquarie University offers. We're very proud of this degree. It, um, uh, emerged in the uh, late uh, 1980s, and uh, I believe it was one of the first fully distance mode uh, Master of Applied Linguistics degrees anywhere in the world. It's evolved into a degree that's now offered on campus or entirely online. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it. Basically, the Master of Applied Linguistics and TESOL degree is open to anybody who has completed a bachelor's degree and has an interest in language and its uses in human communication. The degree is, um, the full length of the degree is two years, but um, many people completed in 1.5 years or even in some cases in one year, depending on their previous qualifications and experience. It's a suitable course for, uh, for people who uh, are aspiring language teachers seeking to enter the language teaching profession, which we abbreviate as TESOL, Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages. It's also suitable, however, for experienced language teachers who are seeking to enhance their qualifications and take their career to another level. And some people also do the uh, course when even if they don't have the intention of being a language teacher or continuing in that field, but are interested in language and communication in, uh, in many spheres of life in society. If you study the Master of Applied Linguistics and TESOL with us, 
um, who study a number of different course units, but uh, perhaps a more interesting way to think about it is some of the big questions that uh, we'll tackle throughout the course. We'll talk, for example, about how languages are learned. What should a modern language classroom look like? Do we even need language classrooms? We'll think about big questions like, how can I keep learners to stay motivated if I'm a language teacher? Or if I'm a language learner, how can I stay motivated myself? We'll also look at things like what language has to do with social justice, because it has a lot to do with social justice. And then some parts of the course go inside the brain to understand what a bilingual brain can do. Because of course, when people are learning additional languages, uh, they are becoming multilingual. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting to look at that from so many different perspectives. There are many degrees in, in applied linguistics and TESOL at the master's level in Australia and indeed around the world. You might be wondering what makes Macquarie's programs unique. There are a few things. One is their flexible delivery. Uh, students can complete their qualification part-time or full-time on campus or online, or a mixture of both. For international students, there are some uh, restrictions on um, the ability to study part-time, particularly if one is on a student visa in Australia. Um, but um, uh, for domestic students, part-time study is, um, is completely available, and many of our students do study part-time. So they can share studies with other commitments to do with family or career. The degree can also be studied entirely on campus or on entirely online or both. Importantly, people who choose to study online uh, sometimes live in other parts of the world and may never set foot on the Macquarie University campus, but there's no on-campus requirement. It's an internationally relevant degree. We have over a thousand graduates um, and current students who come from over 30 countries around the world. And we also have staff who have experienced uh, living, teaching, and researching in many parts of the world. Our degree is part of the Macquarie University Department of Linguistics, which is ranked uh, number 27 in, uh, internationally in uh, linguistics uh, uh, subject rankings. We've also been ranked in the top 10 applied linguistics and TESOL master's programs internationally. And our research record is something that we're very proud of as well. So if you're interested in a master's degree in this field, we'd love to have you join us. I'll now pass over to uh, Aggie Bodis, my colleague, who uh, will tell you a little bit about the Graduate Certificate of TESOL. Thank you, Peter. Um, well, welcome from me too. My name is Aggie Bodis, um, and I convened the Graduate Certificate of TESOL um, course, which forms also the units that it comprises um, form part of the master's um, course as well. It's embedded in the master's course as well. So you have the option to study a graduate certificate of TESOL course, but um, if you choose to, that you really want to study some more, um, this is a pathway to um, a master's course as well. Um, so I'm going to start by looking at what the qualif qualification is good for. Um, where can you teach? With a TESOL qualification. Now, as you can see, there are opportunities both in Australia and internationally as well. Um, you can teach in the primary and high school sector in Australia if you're, if you're a qualified teacher. Um, you can then become an EALT specialist teacher. You can also teach adults, um, um, migrants and refugees um, in the in, in the AMEP program, for example, that's the um, adult migrant English program. Um, and these students are eligible um, for English language support and they, and these support is allocated. Um, actually the allocated hours for this support has just been uncapped, but Sophie can, um, one of our panelists can talk to you about this. Um, you can also teach in the ELICOS sector, which stands for English language intensive courses for overseas students. Um, um, this sector, well, this typically um, um, includes university language centers or private colleges or English language colleges. 
Um, at the moment, this sector is in a bit of a hibernation um, until the borders reopen, but there are many possibilities in this sector once it's revived, so to speak. And um, many of us um, who are present here today have um, worked in this sector and there's many possibilities there for you. Internationally, um, you have the option of teaching in schools, universities, uh, private institutions. When it comes to international companies, um, you might be um, placed to teach um, certain um, job families like teaching accountants. There's also a need, this is basically because um, many international companies have English as their main language language for communication. And so these, at these workplaces, you need to train the, um, the employees. And also there's this emerging area of online teaching. Um, the panelists that we have invited today have an experience um, in covering many of these fields so they can talk to you about this. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So I'll talk to you a bit about the course structure. Um, as you can see, we, um, the course mainly basically consists of four units, um, um, which comprises 40 credit points. It can be studied face-to-face -face or distance, as um, Peter has mentioned already. Um, if you study face-to-face, -face, um, you actually, you become part of class, um, you're on campus, um, and actually it's, it's held in our new state-of-the-art um, central courtyard building, which has videos as well. So if you're a an, um, an distance student, you, you can see the classes from there too. Um, but if you're a distance student, you have access to the same materials, um, short recordings of, of the lectures, the same tasks as, as, as a face-to-face -face student would have. You have an option to study it full-time or part-time. Um, um, I'd like to talk, you about, talk to you about employability. Um, the units are um, um, have a heavy employability focus um, to make sure that you have the best skills for um, your future careers. And this is why it's important um, that all the teaching staff have, have long years of, of ESL experience. Um, we're also active in TESOL research and really passionate about the field. Um, in fact, we've just been um, awarded um, the Faculty Learning Innovation Award for our work in um, the very first the green unit you can see there, about 6,000 language teaching methodologies. Um, um, we changed the unit so that it's more accessible and um, innovative, uses innovative methods of teaching. So in the curriculum, we make sure that we address these employability skills and provide tasks that, and, and information on what is needed for an ESL teacher. And for that, um, I've done a lot of consultation with, with main stakeholders um, primary, from all these sectors that you can see on the right-hand side, primary school, the migrant um, sector, Alicos sector, and EFL teachers as well. Yes, next slide, please. Um, so why become an ESL or an EFL teacher? Um, basically, it's um, a very rewarding, and I'm sure that our panelists will agree as well, it's a rewarding experience to support migrants in Australia. Um, you, you actually make a big difference in someone else's life and, 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 and that person affects you as well. And this is how you need to approach teaching. What can I learn from these students as well? Um, you, you can also, if you go overseas, you can live in and experience a different culture. You can learn a new net language. Um, you can grow through these interactions with our diverse students. And you can also, teaching itself can also be um, a, a career path uh, with many possibilities like in assessment, language assessment, um, materials design, school management. So there's a management pathway as well. Now, this is what I wanted to cover, and I think um, we can move on to talking to um, our panelists who can share their experiences, or maybe I wanted to explain this first. <laughs> of course, you, if you come from the primary and high school sector, um, there is funding opportunity available for you in New South Wales, um, and you can, you can um, find more information on through this um, is going to be shared in the Q&A or the chat um, with you. Um, 
the Teach and Learn scholarships cover many different areas, but EELD teaching is one part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aggie. That's uh, that's uh, a great summary of the graduate certificate of TESOL and some of the uh, career opportunities that uh, follow it. Um, I'd like to uh, now move on to uh, introduce uh, tonight's panel for the discussion. Um, we have uh, three panelists with us tonight. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Janet Freeman, who's listed first on the slide, uh, was, was unable to uh, join us tonight. But um, we have with us uh, tonight uh, Sophie Dyson, who's the um, head um, English uh, ESOL teacher at uh, TAFE in Hornsby. Uh, Bonnie James, who's a former uh, graduate of our graduate certificate of uh, TESOL, or I should say a graduate of our, uh, of our grad cert and the current teacher with the Newcastle TAFE. And we also have uh, Luke Thompson, who's a graduate of our Master of Applied Linguistics and TESOL program, um, and currently works um, in the uh, Department of Linguistics with us. Each of them bring uh, a wealth of uh, different experience, and um, we'd uh, like to uh, send some questions to them and uh, get them to answer them. I'll also be keeping, it, keeping track of your questions coming through on the Q&A, so stick around till um, after we've finished our little panel discussion because we'll have plenty of time to, uh, to address your questions, so keep them coming. I'll hand over to Aggie now to, uh, to uh, carry on with the, um, with the discussion there. Thank you, Peter. Um... I'd like to invite our panelists now to introduce themselves and um, explain their relationships to Macquarie University. So I'm going to start with um, Bonnie. Hi everyone, um, my name is Bonnie. Thank you for having me. I graduated from the Graduate Certificate of TESOL this year and started working as an ESOL teacher at TAFE. So I teach English to migrants, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, prior to this, I worked as an English foreign language teacher online. Um, most of my students were based in China and some of the companies I worked for were Dada and Say ABC. Thank you, Bonnie. Luke? Hi everyone, um, my name's Luke Thompson. I started uh, my English language teaching career in Japan where I taught for over four years. When I returned to Australia, I enrolled in the Master of Applied Linguistics and TESOL course. And after graduating, I started teaching in Ellicos at the English Language Centre at Macquarie University, which is also where I did my teaching practicum during my studies at Macquarie. Um, I've also been teaching in the linguistic department for the last four years on undergraduate units and recently started teaching on the Applied Linguistic and TESOL program. I've also worked with academics from public health and the business school at Macquarie to provide academic language and literacy support to postgraduate students. Thank you, Luke. Sophie? You're mute. He's very good at technology here. Right, is that better? <laughs> so I'm Sophie Dyson, head teacher at, of ESOL at TAFE Hornsby campus. Um, so I've been working at TAFE for 20 years. The last six I've been head teacher. And before that, um, I started my career a bit like Luke, uh, teaching overseas, teaching in France, in fact. Uh, and that was, yeah, that was for six years, quite a long time ago. And when I returned to Australia, I started as, as a part-time casual teacher at TAFE. Um, and I've grad became a full-time teacher and now, now a head teacher. Thank you. So I'm going to um, start with the um, postgraduate student experience, um, questions about your experience, Bonnie and Luke. Um, could you please tell us um, about yourselves also, um, how you arrived at your present um, career um, um, and tell us about the course that you studied? Who would like to go first? You can go first, Bonnie. Oh, Bonnie. Okay, sure. Um, so 
Oh, well, actually, I have a legal background, but I wasn't satisfied with that career. So I went straight to TAFE um, on the Central Coast, so Gosford TAFE, and volunteered in the English language classrooms there, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And from then on, I knew I wanted to teach English. Um, I was eager to start working, though, as well. So um, I got an opportunity to do some online teaching uh, for some Chinese companies. So I did that whilst completing the graduate certificate of TESOL, which has now led me to my job at TAFE. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, what did you like about your course? Ooh, many things. So I studied the course online, um, which might seem daunting at first to study um, a university course online, but actually um, the professors, um, actually Aggie was one of my lecturers, they were very um, contactable and the resources were all easily accessible. Um, probably the thing I enjoyed most were the Zoom sessions. Um, they were very interactive. Um, you could ask the lecturers questions face-to-face, -face, well, sort of face-to-face, -face, virtually speaking on Zoom. We did group work. Um, it was just very um, engaging and I found it um, a much more enriched learning experience compared to traditional lectures. Mm. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Luke? Well, um, I guess my interest in, in language teaching um, sort of coincided with my when I was a language learner overseas. Um, I originally went over to Japan to sort of hoping to do a bonsai apprenticeship and that dream sort of slowly evaporated and I found myself in English language teaching and fell in love with it. Um, not only because I was a student of language, but probably because I, as I was teaching, it was informing what I was learning. Um, in terms of the course, I, I found that it really helped me not only to understand the issues related to language teaching, but it also encouraged me to think about those issues critically. Um, this is particularly useful, I think, in the language teaching industry because it puts you in a position where you, you have the tools to reflect on your own practice and also the curriculum you're working with and even the institution that you're working in. Um, so I found that quite soon after graduating the program, I felt confident enough to suggest and implement changes to what I, the curriculum that I was working with and also to make some suggestions even to senior management about my ideas. I think that having a strong background in theory and even just knowing the right terminology to use, it can really help when you're justifying your ideas and negotiating any sort of change that you feel might be beneficial. Thank you very much, thanks. Let's turn to Sophie now. Um, could you please talk about the adult um, ESL teaching sector you, you're in um, and the current employment opportunities there? Yeah, sure. So um, we've actually, um, over the past few semesters, tried to take as many prac students as we can um, mm -hmm. from the Grad Cert program. So that's my link I forgot to mention with um, Macquarie Uni. So uh, the current state of the ESOL industry, well, um, at TAFE, we have two streams of ESOL courses. We have the AMEP, the Adult Migrant uh, English program, which Aggie mentioned which is federally funded. And at the moment we have approximately 500 students. We also have another stream, which is our smart and skilled New South Wales government funded courses. And we have approximately 200 students. So both streams um, contain almost all fee-free courses for citizens and PRs who need to improve their English. Um, and although there are different legislative and contractual requirements, there are quite a lot of students and classes uh, and thus a need for teachers. Um, now, Aggie mentioned this before, in April, uh, there were changes to the AMEP legislation, meaning that more students who have already done their AMEP uh, can actually, and are now out in the community, can actually come back and resume their study uh, there's no more caps, so to speak, on the number of hours, um, nor the amount of time that they have to study within. So this has made our numbers explode, which is fantastic. Uh, 
so despite no new migrants really arriving due to COVID, um, we're being inundated with students and thus we need lots of teachers. <laughs> Lots of work opportunities, right? Yeah, lot, lots of work opportunities. Um, so, yeah, we have 30, 40 classes running. So for about uh, 700 students, uh, we have courses from complete beginner up until academic English. Um, and prac students uh, do come and teach on all of our courses. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of demand for, for work at a lot of demand at the moment yeah thank you now both bonnie and luke were employed at the at the place where they conducted their practicum yeah. right that's yeah? correct mm. and how did you find that um i i loved my practicum at tafe i had a great mentor teacher she was super supportive and she allowed me to explore um different teaching methodologies, which was um, great. And yeah, I feel really, it's my second home. <laughs> so. Did you have to do anything, um, any extra studies um, to be employed um, at TAFE? Uh, the graduate certificate of TESOL was what I did, yeah, to get that stepping stone into, into TAFE. Is there any other requirement maybe? There's no certificate? Oh, yes. Can, shall I answer that or sorry? Yes, please, Sophie. Yeah, yeah. So um, to work at TAFE in TESOL, you need a grad cert or dip in um, TESOL, uh, but you also need something called the certificate for in training and assessment and the code for the latest what iterations of this course 40116. So it's the CERT 4 TAE 40116. Now this is delivered at TAFE or through various private training um, organisations, uh, but you must have this, even if you have a doc, even if you have a doctorate in TESOL, you must you must have uh, this this course to work at TAFE. Yeah. Yes, mm. probably we all have that, right? Yes. Mm. <laughs> I did I mine did. while I was working at TAFE actually. Um, yeah, I did mine online. It took me four weeks to do the cert for. So, oh, that's yeah, I think that's quite fast for these days anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to ask you about um, um, opportunities teaching overseas. Um, both Luke and Bonnie and Sophie had experienced teaching overseas, um, myself included. Um, in different ways though. So many students, many of our, even our present students are um, taking part in or planning to take part in a program called JET, um, which is an exchange program between Japan and other nations. And um, the participants are involved in teaching positions, um, teaching roles in Japan. Um, Luke, um, you've taken part in, in this program, haven't you? Yeah, um, the JET program is quite unique in that uh, it really has a lot of dependent contextual factors. I mean, it depends on whichever school you go to will have a completely different um, understanding of what your role should be. And so to have a really good understanding of um, how to adapt to situations and how to be flexible um, and work with others um, and to know, let sort of work in a way that lets people know that you know what you're doing um, is really, really important on that program because um, it's very easy to become marginalised if you're not able to sort of show what you're able to do. All right, thank you. Bonnie, um, could you tell us about your work experience teaching um, students in China online? Yeah, so I did that alongside studying the Graduate Certificate of TESOL. Um, I taught students one-on-one, -on -one. I taught small groups of students, I taught whole classrooms where I actually got to work with the class teacher um, as well as the students. Um, what I found probably most interesting was um, the level of rapport that I was able to build with these students. It's the same as teaching face-to-face in terms of rapport, which amazed me. I still have contact with some of these students, um, but I've never met them face to face. So um, yeah, that's good. And also gaining the um, skills to teach online, it, 
um, was very important and even more so now since COVID-19. So even though I'm not teaching online at the moment, it's a comfort to know that if I'm ever forced to or I want to go back to teaching online, I can do that. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, well, this is what um, I planned to include um, in the panel, panel session. Um, I think we can move on to the Q&A now um, and answering questions of the participants. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Aggie, and thanks to all the panelists. Keep your questions coming. Um, uh, a, few, a few of the questions I've uh, typed uh, answers on uh, online just uh, where they were easy to answer, but uh, a number of them I thought it would be good to actually uh, discuss. Um, and uh, so uh, we have uh, we have one uh, question here uh, uh, from someone who says, uh, I used to be a teacher for Arabic and French for 11 years in Lebanon. I have a Bachelor of Education. From where should I start? Um, and uh, I think um, that uh, you could uh, you could start where you like, really. So uh, many people who uh, or have some experience as a language teacher, maybe not teaching English, uh, or have experience as a teacher uh, teaching other subjects but not teaching language subjects, uh, want to get into the uh, the area of teaching English as a second or additional language. Um, and uh, so, if uh, a, a good place to start is often with the graduate certificate, uh, because that's a, that's a short qualification, as uh, Aggie has outlined. Um, and uh, it enables you to get a real feel for the practical, the practicalities of the uh, of the area. Uh, and the good thing about it is that uh, if you do the graduate certificate, which can be done in um, uh, is is often done part time over say a year, but uh, can actually be done in six months if someone really wants to do it in that uh, short time, uh, full time. Uh, the good thing is that, that one can then move on to. Uh, a bachelor's degree and get full credit for having done the, um, the graduate certificate units. So, um, so with the graduate certificate, uh, another year of full-time study would, uh, would convert it into a master's degree. So I think that um, uh, that's what I would say there. If you're sure you want to do a master's degree, then you can certainly enroll the master's degree. But if you're not, you're not sure you want to get a feel, do the graduate certificate, and if you decide to proceed to a master's degree, it, it will all count towards that as well. Do you have anything else to add there, um, uh, Aggie, or anyone else? I think Luke came to this um, qualification with the uh, came to this course with a teaching qualification, right, in a different discipline. Yeah, so I, I used to be an art teacher actually, um, and. Uh, yeah, I think that you definitely there's a lot of advantages to having some background in education, but um, the the graduate certificate definitely gives you everything you need for um, to language teaching, and um, so even those without any teaching experience, it's um, it's definitely suitable. Whereas those with with some teaching experience can can. Um, benefit from looking at how language is taught. Mm, exactly. Um, especially those, um, those students who are already in ELD positions um, or teaching some kind of ELD um, or doing some kind of ELD specialist teaching in primary schools, for example, can learn a lot um, as um, we are providing lots of very important information on how um, on, on how to teach, how to scaffold language learning um, um, in, in, for your students. Um, I've had many good um, feedback from, from teachers who have been teaching ELD for a while and then did our courses and, and, and learned a lot. Um, mm. the, the main thing is to become a reflective learner, which means that you, you, can, um, you can reflect on what you, what you are performing, so your strengths and weaknesses, and then um, identify what you need to improve and act upon it. And that's the most important thing, um, because then you will learn through your whole career and you will keep on improving. And, and all that 
was embedded in the practicum. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't come from a teaching background. I did some tutoring in languages, but I was never qualified as a teacher before um, completing the course. But um, yeah, the practicum was amazing because you can also do it in sort of a time frame you get to choose if you want to do it faster or over a longer period of time I chose to do it over a longer period just to get that more in-depth learning and as Aggie said um, reflect upon what I've learned through the course and how I'm going how I applied it while teaching. Mm. If I could just go back to that point um, that Bonnie was making before about the suitability of her placement I, I've also had the same experience I felt like the the teaching team at Macquarie were really good at, you know, finding, helping you understand where you would fit best um, mm -hmm. based on, you know, the teaching, the, the learning and the teaching that you've done together. And like Bonnie, I, I felt at home straight away and I knew I wanted to work there straight away. And um, I think it really, really, it's a really good system that's in place. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And the lecturers at Macquarie Uni as well, there's that ongoing support. So um, if you have questions about job opportunities or further studies, you can always reach out to um, yeah, your lecturers. Yeah, that's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everyone. That's, uh, that's uh, great. I think it's probably uh, uh, answered that question and, and maybe some others as well. The next question I have here is um, about the major difference between um, uh, the graduate certificate of TESOL and the linguistics degree. So basically we have both of our degrees, uh, the, both of our qualifications, the graduate certificate of TESOL and the master of applied linguistics and TESOL, they both include a, a TESOL component, so a teaching English to speakers of other languages component. Um, is there any difference in the future career is the uh, other part of the question. Um, I think uh, the, um, the, the graduate certificate of TESOL, I think, is a, what we might think of as an entry-level qualification. So it's something that uh, that gets you into the field and uh, at the you know, at, at the ground level, and it gives you a chance to see if you like it. Gives you a chance to, uh, as the speakers have just been talking about, do a do a practicum, a, a practical placement in a in a in an institution, and uh, and then uh, if you um, in some cases, people already have other qualifications where they sort of feel, well, uh, the graduate certificate uh, basically complements my existing qualifications and, um, and that's all I need for now. Um, I think other people probably do the graduate certificate and they, um, it's the first degree that, the first qualification they have in anything related to uh, language study or language learning. And for those people, if they like it and they want to make it a career, then probably a, a master's degree will will open up certainly more doors to uh, to more senior positions in um, in institutions. That's my take on it. But uh, maybe some of our panelists uh, or uh, or Aggie might like to to add something. Mm. Well, I haven't done the masters in TESOL yet, but I think it would definitely help with from what I've read about it. Just um, to refine your teaching skills and again just continue to learn as a teacher because that's always important so yeah also if you want to move on from um maybe um even in, in esl um if, if i think about the alicos sector for example if you want to move to a higher management position all the the skills that you acquire through the master's course um like language testing curriculum um studies those are really important for, for you to implement um, or in your teaching or in your, in your management as well. Uh, not talking about, also there's, you can also take part in projects, um, like curriculum projects. Luke took part mm -hmm. in one, right? I was gonna say, I think that the um, applied linguistics aspect of the course is really um, handy for um, curriculum development opportunities. And actually that's something that's coming up quite a lot now. Um, as there's a lot of government scholarships to um, change courses to, to more blended delivery, more um, integrated learning. Um, so having those, having a higher degree can really help you um, get into those sort of positions. There's also a lot of um, MOOCs. I think they've, I think that's the right pronunciation. The, the um, massive open online courses are becoming really, really popular. And, 
and they take a long time to develop. Um, I worked on one of those for five weeks and I was a minute part of it um, because they're delivered to so many people. So there's a lot of opportunities in curriculum development, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all very much. That's great. Um, just a quick question about the timetable. Uh, the question, the, the participant asked, may I ask about the timetable? Is it mostly after 4 p.m. night classes or on weekends? Um, basically, the on-campus uh, offerings are for the master's degree. They can be all through the day at different times of the day, um, at, but not on the weekends, basically Monday to Friday. Um, with the graduate certificate units, some of which are shared by the, the master's degree, um, two of those, I believe, are generally scheduled um, out, uh, from, from 4 p.m. and they follow on from each other so that some people, um, some people come to attend who want to attend on campus but are, are, are teaching during the day uh, come from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., I think. Is that right, I think? Yeah. 2 p.m. to 4 and 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. 4 to 6, okay. So they're, yeah, the so they're, they're, um, so they're, they're, um, they're earlier. We, um, uh, I think if um, we've got uh, people studying, obviously, in many different uh, situations, some who want to study full time and are kind of free during the day and keen to use that time, others who have uh, work during the day, some people have commitments in the evening, so they're, they're not free then. Mm -hmm. So... I think with the timetabling, what we generally suggest to people is um, look at look at when the when the different components are offered, the units that you want to study in any particular session, uh, and if you're able to come to campus and you want to, then enroll on campus. If not, you can enroll online, uh, and it's, um, it's the same content and it's designed to be to be done that way. And in fact, many many people do the degree partly or completely online. So um, just a matter of uh, um, uh, looking at what's timetabled when and then choosing. I think Bonnie wanted to uh, add a comment there. Oh yeah, I just did the whole course online and it was very flexible. So everything was recorded. And like I said previously, everything was very accessible. Um, yeah. We also provide uh, many of our units um, also run um, the online option can be done what we call synchronously or asynchronously. Asynchronously would mean that you would be um, covering the same materials, um, maybe shorter lectures, and but doing the same tasks and posting them, engaging with other students. Mm -hmm. uh, the synchronous version is that many of um, our units um, um, lecturers do is that they set up a Zoom uh, link for their classes. Peter teaches like that. Luke has done that, right? Um, and they um, basically you've got the face-to-face -face class and the Zoom people in the same session. They it's very popular, I have to say. Yes, I think the um, last twenty twenty kind of uh, changed our thinking in a lot of ways. And uh, if there's anything positive that's come out of all the all the the negative. Uh, elements of it it's that we uh, we're, we see more possibilities for you know i guess delivering things and continuing to um, can adapt to delivering things to where people are and where people need to be so um, thank you yeah um another question we have here is it just pure coincidence um the guest speakers are all from TAFE, tafe or esl teaching opportunities most likely in tafe at the moment um asking whether International Foundation or EALD opportunities in schools are not very promising at the moment. Um, certainly, um, uh, as uh, Sophie indicated, uh, there's, um, there are a lot of students at TAFE at the moment, particularly under the, um, the Adult Migrant English Program, uh, that, and that's certainly keeping, uh, keeping the need for teachers uh, high there. Um, also, in the, in the school sector, in the, um, in the school sector, it's important to remember that um, people who are teaching in schools are already qualified um, teachers for primary school or high school. So we don't provide um, the, the basic qualification that enables one to uh, teach any subject in a, in a high school or primary school. That's a, there are particular educational qualifications people need for that. But our qualifications are recognised by the New South Wales Education Standards Authority 
as giving you uh, what's called an EALD specialization. So English is an additional language or dialect specialization. And uh, many schools in, um, in New South Wales have specialist uh, EALD teachers who work with the students who are basically uh, in mainstream classes, but uh, need some additional support with, uh, with English language because of the, they, they've come from um, uh, uh, backgrounds where there may be a different language spoken at home, for instance. So it's just additional support. And so that, that certainly does continue. And I don't think the need there has really changed. Certainly, uh, anything that depends on international students being in Australia at the moment um, is uh, happening at a very low level. Some, there is some online, um, online teaching going on, but certainly not the, the, the new international arrivals that we have been seeing. I guess at some point that will, uh, that will pick up again. We don't know exactly where it is, when, when that will be, but, um, but I guess one can prepare oneself for, for the day that it, it does happen. But you're right at the moment that uh, that's pretty, um, that, that's uh, at a low level at the moment. Anyone else want to comment on that? Oh. Sophie? Yeah. Well, I just, just wanted to say that, yeah, so our, pro, our AMEP uh, has never been busier, and that is because of the, well, not never been busier, but it's very, very busy and growing, um, and that's because the legislation changed and word has got out into the community that students who have studied AMEP before can come back. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention why perhaps there were so many um, TAFE representatives um, in terms of the AMEP. So TAFE, at least for the Sydney region, or most of the, the AMEP is organised in different regions to TAFE, but TAFE won the, won the AMEP uh, contracts and does still have them in most of Sydney. So that, that's why uh, in adult education, um, there is a lot of work um, despite the closed borders because you know, there's always migrants needing to learn English. And uh, yeah, we, we have the majority of the contract um, and it does get renewed every three years. So it'll go out to tender, but hopefully we'll continue to get it. But so far we've had it for nine years. Um, yeah, so a lot of, yeah, that is the biggest um, uh, migrant English program in Australia and yet yeah, TAFE does have the, the bulk of those um, courses. In Thank saying, to, yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> you guys, Go I was just going to respond quickly. Um, yeah. In saying that I teach at Gosford and Newcastle TAFE, at Gosford we have the AMEP contract, but not at Newcastle, but I still have my position at Newcastle too. So it's interesting how both at, at state level, the state level funding and the federal funding, it's, yeah, working both ways there. Hmm. What I wanted to add was the, the mm -hmm. primary school sector. So just because the, the borders are closed, it doesn't mean that the students are not there. So yeah. um, all the students, um, so the funding, maybe some um, students with an ESL background um, have funding for, for some support for one day. Um, it doesn't mean that they do not need support from their, from their classroom teachers. So if, if we have primary school teachers here with us today, in the um, attendees, um, doing a, a, a TESOL certificate will, will increase your employability because you will be able to teach um, in, in, in schools where, where there are ESL students um, who do not get all the support that they need um, mm -hmm. from an ELD specialist. So as a classroom teacher, you can do a lot. You can, you can learn a lot and, and use that. There's also career pathways as well um, for you as an ELD teacher. I can still see a lot of um, ads for ELD teachers um, online. So um, there are opportunities, but you need to be an accredited teacher, of course. Okay, thank you, Aggie. Yeah, we've got a few more questions, so I might move through them fairly quickly if I can. Um, uh, this one, I think I can answer myself. Uh, uh, the, the participant, thank you for your question, said, I know now is probably the worst time for international education, but do you think international students will return to Australia quickly and can we find enough opportunities for ESL teaching? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's very difficult to say when international students will return because we've had lots of predictions um, in the last uh, 12 months that haven't come true. Uh, so 
I think it's fair to say that international students will return at some point, but it might not be um, it might not be this year. Uh, it might be, but uh, I wouldn't. Um, I don't think we can we can be sure about it. Uh, I think, as as we've talked about, there are other opportunities for um, uh, for teaching English language teaching for for people who are already in the country. Um, and uh, at some point, the international students will return, and so that will will uh, open up the uh, the LA cost industry again. Um, but uh, I think, in summary, there are certainly opportunities out there still uh, with the um, you know with the people that we have in Australia. Um, and uh, uh, and at some point, uh, if you are of the mind that you like to prepare for the future, um, at some point there will be these additional opportunities. But certainly not. It probably in the next uh, few months. Um, I'll, I'll move quickly to the next uh, one just to make sure we go through. This uh, participant said very interested in teaching ESL, uh, especially um, from North Asia. I came from Japan. Can you elaborate a little bit more on your experience of this? If I do this, where do we find opportunities? I feel like it's very hard. So um, this is teaching ESL, especially students from North Asia. I, I think, um, I guess, uh, Luke, you have some experience there. I think you're muted, Luke, uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm just trying to um, think about what the question what actually requires me to talk about. Um, I guess we're talking about uh, students that have come to Australia from from North Asia, yeah. Um, so mm. I'm not uh, uh, not sure. If maybe the maybe the the person who's asked the question maybe say uh, uh, whether you're interested in teaching in Japan or in North Asia, or teaching um, teaching students from that region in Australia, yeah. Um, Maybe you can you can pop another question up there. I'll, I might move on in the meantime. I'll just leave that question there, and we'll we'll um, we'll keep going. Um, the uh, another uh, participant asks: Apart from the degree, do you offer specialized units focusing on teaching English to certain language users, for example, Japanese? Um, and then they've written uh, arigato in Japanese at the bottom. So um, I'm glad you chose Japanese to write at the bottom because uh, um, it's. Uh, one of the few languages other than English that I speak a little bit of. Um, in this case, uh, we we don't we don't offer courses that off that specialize in teaching units to, to teaching English to certain users. However, I think the whole philosophy of our teaching is that um, we we keep learners' needs in mind and we keep the context in mind. So uh, we're always you know, thinking about or you know, asking our students to think about the context in which they work, the constraints you know, that operate there and the requirements and what students need and the kind of that can relate to the, the levels of, of English that students come in with at different times, uh, why they're learning and all of those kinds of things. So I think we, we, don't, we don't sort of divide it up according to uh, students from particular language or cultural backgrounds, but we do certainly uh, promote, I guess, an approach where people think about that and use that as the starting point for designing curricula, thinking about materials and methods and, and things like that. Yeah. I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to keep going to to make sure we get through before we finish here. Um, uh, um, uh, in terms, just coming just coming back to the uh, the, um, the the question before about um, uh, about students from North Asia and Japan, um, the uh, I think the participant who asked that question has come back and said um, that they're interested in both. Uh, if they can't find opportunities here, uh, they might move back to to Japan to continue teaching. So. Oh, okay. So I, I would say that um, the course would prepare you for either. And I think that kind of comes back to my um, something I was talking about earlier, which is the kind of the adaptability and the flexibility that um, applied linguistics and, and taking that approach to or well, having that background knowledge, it allows you to sort of really adapt yourself to a range of situations. So 
I guess I would be saying that having a really strong background in linguistics gives you the opportunity for both and widens your opportunities, yeah. Good, thank, thank you very much, Lou. Yeah, that's, that's great, yeah. Um, one question I think that uh, our panelists might be able to answer here is um, uh, in terms of job vacancies, do you feel that there's more chances of getting an ESL job in regional areas than in Sydney, like in the Central Coast, Newcastle or Port Macquarie? Um, I live in the nor lower North Shore and found it very hard to uh, to find jobs. So um, I don't know if some of our panelists can talk to that. Um, Bonnie, I think you uh, mm. you uh, are working in um, Newcastle and Central Coast. Yeah, so I work in Newcastle and Gosford. Um, I also do relief teaching for other TAFEs in the area. So there's a few, there's a couple of TAFEs in Newcastle. So there's the Ties Hill one in Glendale. Um, there's Wyong as well. So I think there's, yeah, maybe I'm not, I can't really fully straight answer because I don't know um, what the job opportunities are like between Sydney, but maybe Sophie can answer. I do know I've got a classmate who did find a job in Sydney at a couple of different TAFEs. So, yeah, sorry. Oh, <laughs> Sophie thanks. might have a better answer. Would you like to comment there, uh, Sophie? Oh, well, uh, if you're from the Lower North Shore, yes, uh, come and visit us at Hornsby. <laughs> um, but no, so different migrants, as you know, have in the past been shunted, if that's the word, to certain areas. So um, there are a lot of, um, oh, no, I can't remember, in Port Macquarie. Um, there's a big, anyway, there's a big refugee community in Port Macquarie. And then, yes, a lot of our students actually come uh, here if they can't find the course they need. They do even come from the, the Central Coast. Um, uh, what was I going to say? So um, I don't, I think the government is stopping this or trying not to sort of send huge groups of migrants to regional areas. I, I think, I think Sydney still would have more, more employment opportunities. Um, the thing with TAFE, so as I said, our, well, as I will say, uh, some of our best, well, best teachers are from the Macquarie Uni Grad Cert program. So whether or not they've had experience or not before, uh, what usually happens if they come, if they're able to get a prac with us and we like them and they like TAFE, um, we literally have an informal interview with the student and uh, the head teachers. Uh, we take their documents, we put them on nomination and pretty much as soon as we can give you work, what well, we, we do. So it is a good way in doing um, where, where you do your, your prac, which um, uh, other people have mentioned. Um, but at TAFE, um, after you've been on nomination for a while, every now and then a, a formal recruitment comes up for part-time casual teachers. And so we tell all our new teachers on nomination to apply for that. And that then, because of one TAFE, means you can work at any TAFE. You don't have to go through the whole recruitment uh, process. Um, you can work at any TAFE in, in New South Wales. So you could start at one and, and move around. Um, but yeah, some of our best teachers have come from knocking on the door, meeting us, and we've then been able to offer them work. I'd say just keep trying to that person, keep approaching or try a different campus, but I think there's probably more work in Sydney than regional areas. Great. Thank you very much, Sophie, and thanks, Bonnie, earlier for your answer. I think we're um, at the end of our questions now, and we're just perfectly at the end of our time as well. So. Um, I'd like to thank um, uh, my colleague Aggie, as well as our three panelists, uh, Sophie, Luke, and Bonnie. Um, and I'd like to thank um, Diana and Vivi also for organizing this and Andrew behind the scenes for making sure all the technology works well. Um, I think it's been a wonderful session and I've really enjoyed it. And I really hope that um, uh, most of all, I guess I'd like to thank the people who've uh, come along and attended tonight and stayed with us uh, through, the, through the whole hour. I hope it's been useful, and um, uh, you'll be able you you can easily um, contact us uh, if you'd like to ask more questions. And I hope that we'll meet some of you um, in our courses in the near future. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, and have a very good evening. Thank you.
Thank you.